So hi everyone, I'm Michael. Very glad to see all of you here. Joining us today are two amazing UCSD labs, NeLab Neural Engineering and Translation Lab and ISN Integrated System Neural Engineering Lab. NeLab will present first about mental health detection with neural technology and ISN will present second on the development of EEG earbuds. So first off, NeLab or Neural Engineering and Translation Lab aim to advance the understanding of neurocognitive circuits across the lifespan. NeLab interface neural technologies for scalable brain health mapping, monitoring, and precision therapeutics. Some focuses of NeLab includes understanding the function of neural circuits underlying cognitive behavior, developing closed loop technologies for targeted treatment of neural circuit dysfunction, and studying the relationship between neurocognition, mental health, and pressing societal issues. So I'm very happy to introduce to all of you our amazing speakers today from NeLab. Dr. Jyoti Mishura is the director and founder of, the, of NeLab at UCSD. Dr. Mishura is also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. She has expertise in computational, cognitive, and translational neurosciences. For the presentation today, she will take us through neurotechnology used for advancing mental wellness and really neurocognition to mental health. Next, we have Gillian Grennan, who is the lead research associate for human research in NeLab. She is also a UCSD alum in the class of 2019, majoring in cognitive science and behavioral science. Today, she will share with us her 2021 research publication, Cognitive and Neural Correlates of Loneliness and Wisdom During Emotional Bias, which is featuring the news, UCSD House, Neuroscience News, NBC San Diego, and ABC 10 News. Very exciting. Last but not least, we have Aditi Krishna Kumar, who is the research assistant at NeLab. She is also a student at UCSD, pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Science with a specialization in machine learning and neurocomputation. Today, she will share with us her experience as a research assistant in NeLab and how you can get involved. Thanks, guys. Thanks for such a nice introduction. It is, um, a pleasure to be uh, presenting with my really able and fascinating, um, hello my team, they're amazing. Uh, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. If you could allow that, then I can start sharing or you do have our slides as well. Um, I can't say enough for, uh, about everybody and Labs who has contributed so much to our team and continues to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're really happy to present with Jillian and Aditi today. Um, um, so yeah, uh, you guys wanted to talk a little bit about the neurophysiology and mental state prediction. I know um, I myself have about 10 minutes of time, uh, so um, please stop me, but I'll try to, you know, our, our goals are really driven by um, the interests of the various members of the, of the lab. Neat Labs is a, a very inclusive team um, in, I think um, it, it has been larger in the non-pandemic years and in the pandemic years, but nonetheless, we remain very productive. Our goals are really to advance neurotech for mental health. Um, we uh, we are an exciting bunch of um, individuals bringing together neuroscientists, engineers, and clinicians and in order to solve mental health problems through engineering and then also see them being translated towards patients. Um, but this is slide I bring up a lot because of the, um, you know, the, the problems that we face in society today related to um, social justice issues. And we really want to be proactive in saying um, Amit Labs is a place where people can feel inclusive and, um, you know, as a safe environment and also an environment where any kind of... Um, uh, perspectives that you bring are are respected, and I think that's very important in this world. And, and that's why we take the, the racial justice inclusion and, and diversity pledge. Um, as the lads, you know, what we what we really envisioned um, is to be able to perform community accessible brain mapping. What that means is that um, psychology and neuroscience today has mostly been um, uh, you know confined to the laboratory setting, where there is the you know the, the elite members of the university can participate in that. But you know the members of our community are much more diverse, and uh, sometimes they're not able to come to the settings that we um, record in. And so we wanted to have at least the tool sets that would allow us to um, perform research grade recordings uh, in the uh, in the non lab setting. And that's what we ended up. Um, developing a platform for in the last two or three years, which uses wireless EEG and um, a set of um, engaging neurocognitive games that the individual plays. And um, the, the what we present to people and the tests we do are very much embedded within a concept of cognitive neuroscience and then the rigor of cognitive neuroscience. But what we've done is just make them more rapid and scalable and recordable in any setting. And eventually why we want to do that is because um, we want to get towards more personalized um, well-being of the individual um, that is informed by um, the neuroscientific data, not just you know simple uh, mental health reports that a clinician may get at today. Um, there are a lot of projects in the lab where we really try to integrate many aspects um, or dimensions of the individual. I'm not going to be able to get through um, any of the projects. We have um, a very core animal research team that really gets into a single cell recordings and neuron circuits is something we love to work on both in humans and in animals um, and how they relate individual behavior. That is basically what Galen's paper is about. Um and that, that you uh, know got a lot of press uh, earlier this year. So people are really excited about that kind of work. And then eventually we think about the individual in the context of their family and community as well. And we do large sample community studies in that regard also, but um, I'm not gonna be able to touch on that concept so much, but um, you know, uh, we are really thinking about this whole uh, circle, so to say. Um, uh, this slide just says that yes, neurocognition is important no matter what mental disorder one might look at. Um, so it's important for overall healthy functioning, but also for dysfunctional circuits that might happen in any mental health condition. It's important to get an understanding of neurocognition. We've known this for a long time, but when you actually look at the clinic, um, what the clinician um, does is that really a, a very simple subjective analysis of um, how a patient might be feeling. So, you know, there's a cartoon says, well, he, he looks like he has too high solitary and lethargic, and so that's definitely a disorder. Well, that's not how we want to work with the state of the art. Um, we need to have methods that are informed by neuroscience, that are scalable, that are cost effective. Otherwise, how are you really going to translate to communities that that have low resources, that are rapid, that are comprehensive? Doctors today don't really have the time for very elaborate, you know, recordings that research labs have the luxury to do. Um, and of course, data driven is built into that concept. And so, this is um, sort of the platform that we came up with. Um, the team that led this led this work, and Jillian's been a really uh, integral uh, core of this team for some time now. Um, 
uh, she's like you said now the lead research associate but even before this year she was with us just like how other uh, joined us um before this during was when she was part of um her undergrad program she joined us at that time uh, and started contributing to the work and now in a really uh, fundamental way she'll talk about but essentially it's, it's a rapid suite of assessments that we do both cognitive recordings on as well as a brain recordings on and um you know we can get at the sort of what's happening underlying these processes in the brain of, um with regard to many different processes you know that are enumerated over here um uh, we not only worked on the front end how to deliver these systems in um community settings but we've also worked hard on the back end how to process the neural data in state-of-the-art ways this is um Ali Alejandro who's uh, depicted here he was a grad student from the ECE department with us and he built an entire pipeline with us that was um that updated the state-of-the-art in terms of how do you localize um, EEG data that is collected on the scalp and how do you localize that better to specific brain regions and then how do you analyze things um, statistically in, in, the, in normal space instead of only in scalp space which has really I think um, um, you know helped in better interpretation of some of the work that we do and helped to link that work with the broader neuroimaging literature as well um, yeah and then uh, you know with that you know what we end up getting at or it, there's nothing um, specifically I want to point to in this picture but it's like you know, we're, we're getting at is that when you are able to easily uh, collect data on a large number of individuals you can get at uh, normative brain maps of what any given individual which in this case so this is a person's brain map and how they look in brain areas relative to the mean of the population. Now we have um, over 300 people who the team has actually um, scanned with this method so you can develop normative data sets. So wherever you're seeing something like green, that's how their brain's performing relative to the general population. Um, whereas red would be where there's overactivity. I mean, blue would be where there is um, a lesser activity than the mean that's happening. So you can have more of this interpretation for many different cognitive functions that are labeled up top. Um, and, and then you can start understanding at the brain level where um, there might be uh, typical or atypical functioning going on. Um, because we wanted to touch base on um, mental health issues, we then also go on and relate these with what is how the individual is themselves perceiving as having anxiety, depression, in this case, hyperactivity, and attention role, these symptoms or other symptoms that Dylan might talk about. Um, uh, just very briefly, uh, we don't just think about, um, you know, in a minute, we, uh, like I said, our understanding of the brain and neural circuits is while while taking um, the, the wholeness of the individual. So our brains kind of don't really exist uh, in isolation. We as humans are uh, constantly, um, you know, what our brains reflect is what we do on a daily basis. How, what are they, or how do we exercise? How do we sleep? What's our daily stress like? How, and what do we eat and whatnot? So this is a, yet another study where a really talented undergraduate student Rupik, worked with us. And, um, and this study aims at taking all of these measures using wearables um, and uh, including the brain-based recordings and using NF1 uh, machine learning models that, that Rupik helped with design um, to get at what would be the most optimal state of any given individual. And if they're not in an optimal state, what would you recommend to them in terms of um, optimal sleep activity diet, et cetera. And this is where we're moving towards in terms of uh, moving away from mental health interventions as a one-size-fits-all strategy to something that's you know, providing to individuals what they might actually need. Um, Jillian's actually helping run one of these studies right now. And um, and this kind of uh, work is um, very much includes aspects of mindfulness in there as well, for which we have digital applications. And it doesn't just apply to um, patients, but also to healthcare providers. So this particular study that we're running right now is called the WellMind study. The WellMind study is currently running in medical students and medical professionals. Um, but I understand that there is a great need for student wellness um, beyond uh, the medical profession as well. So we hope to be able to do this work in the UCSD community more broadly in the near future. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, like I said, myself, I'll just end here saying we have a really wonderful team and um, that I'm really privileged and honored to work with every day, even throughout the pandemic. People um, such as Jalen presenting today have worked really hard. And you can also see that other things joined us from a really um, you know, amazing time zone of 4.30 a.m. And so people, you know, really did their best, which is amazing. And I think that um, sort of our, our motivations to be able to um, change mental health care in the future are, are, are what drive this work. Um, the scalability of the work allows us to work in newer settings. So uh, we, we have a team up in Australia that is very much um, uh, knows how to do the recordings that we do. And we've um, delivered those recordings to them. They work very well with us on the on the analytics side. Similarly, we've had projects in India for a long time where we uh, developed and delivered our tools to um, low resource communities. So it allows us to not just have a local reach, but also um, a global reach, which we're really proud of. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to um, Jillian. And she's going to talk about her really uh, nice study that she completed this year. Cool. Yeah, so this one is looking at cognitive correlates of loneliness and wisdom. Um, essentially, we were um, launching off of previous research done by the Stein Institute of Aging, which had shown that wisdom could be a potential protective factor against deficits due to loneliness or due to increased age. Um, so we wanted to look at essentially um, where these two constructs were happening in the brain and in what context. Um, so with this, we looked at first the relationship between loneliness and wisdom. We found that these were inversely correlated with each other, um, and they also both served as predictors for the other, um, along with social network size, which is sort of an objective measure of just how big yeah, your friend group, family group, things like that are. Um, and then in terms of our brainy tasks, we used it in, in the context of an emotion bias task, um, which essentially just presents different faces with varied emotions, and the participant has to report the direction of the arrow on the face presented. Um, we found that within the loneliness relationships, we only observed a significant relationship in the angry trial type. So when angry faces were presented, um, higher loneliness correlated to slower response speed. Um, in the wisdom relationships, we observed a significant correlation only within happy trials, and we observed an opposite relationship where increased wisdom actually um, correlated to faster response speeds. Uh, and then we use this to guide our neural analyses as well. So we kept exploring loneliness within the context of angry trials and then wisdom within the context of happy. Um, we found that loneliness was significantly related to activity within the transverse temporal region, uh, which is a region that's been previously attributed to um, processing of social interactions. So 
it's part of the temporal parietal junction, which has previously shown that um, in lonely individuals or people with interpersonal difficulties, um, they show more variation or increased responses to negative feedback or stimuli. Um, and then we also saw activity within the left superior parietal lobal, um, which is an early processing region, which suggested that lonelier individuals had enhanced attention to these angry emotion distractors. Um, within wisdom, we also saw an effect in the left transverse temporal um, region, or the TPJ. Um, and then, but this was just in the context of happy trials. So um, we saw sort of an inverse relationship um, with higher wisdom correlating to higher activity within just happy context and then higher loneliness correlating to higher activity within just an angry context. Um, so those were very specific relationships. Um, we also saw wisdom associated with increased activity in the insular region, which is an area associated with emotional and cognitive attention and sort of empathic regulation, which are all behaviors also associated with our wisdom scale that we used. Um, so essentially we used this platform um, our brainy platform, which is, as Jody mentioned, very scalable. We were able to record 150 participants using this um, and then also have them fill out self-reported scales of loneliness and wisdom. Um, so we're able to contribute sort of to this larger social construct. Um, because as you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, with loneliness rates increasing and research coming out about how loneliness is correlated to increased depression, anxiety, potentially lower lifespan, finding um, ways to like, mitigate those effects by potential intervention studies um, has become more and more important. So seeing wisdom as a potential protective factor and seeing where those regions are correlated in the brain could serve as future intervention studies. So we could use the TPJ as a potential site for neuromodulation in the future, and then hopefully eventually alleviate effects of loneliness in participants. Well, yeah, I'll pass on to Aditi, and she can talk about her experience as a research assistant. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I am going to talk a little bit about my own experience um, as an undergraduate research assistant and um, why I wanted to join a lab and meet lab specifically. So um, I'm a second year majoring in computer science with machine learning. Um, and I've always been interested in this combination of computer science, technology, AI, which is why uh, meet lab seems really interesting to me. Um, I think in terms of why I want to join a research lab specifically, I feel like um, it's a great opportunity to just explore um, different career paths, um, especially being at UCSD, which is you know, known for its research. I knew I definitely wanted to um, make use of the opportunities I have and learn about how the knowledge I learn in class um, ties into you know, what's going on in the real world. So um, that's why I highly recommend um, as an undergraduate getting research experience, even if you're not entirely sure whether you, know, you want to go into research later on. Um, it's a great way to just go beyond your classroom curriculum and actually apply the knowledge that you learn. Um, you develop you know, both technical and soft skills, and you also get an idea of what skills you actually need to succeed in whatever um, field you're interested in. And aside from that, it's just you know, a great way to build a profile and show your ability to actually go above and beyond. Um, so my experience as a research assistant, um, I joined Meet Labs during my freshman year, so it's been um, a little bit over a year that I've been a part of the lab. Um, I actually found out about Meet Labs through um, a senior at a common student organization that I was a part of. Um, so pre-COVID, I actually had a chance to you know, go in person to the lab. I learned how to use and set up an EG, um, and my role was basically guiding participants who studied, which was really cool and exciting. Um, and now that everything is remote, I help out with the data analysis um, of the EG data using MATLAB. And the project that I'm currently contributing towards under Julian um, is about how climate change affects cognition. So um, we basically um, got EG data from people who were displaced by the um, Californian wildfires last year. Last year? Yeah, last year. <laughs> and um, we were looking at how that has affected the neural circuitry. Basically how um, the neural factors, cognitive factors, mental health factors interact with external factors, and in this case, climate change. Um, and it's really great because I got to learn how to use MATLAB, um, got a sense of EG data. Um, and yeah, I hope to continue learning from a little bit so far. Um, and if you are you know, wondering about how to go about getting into such position as an undergraduate, just some kind of suggestions that um, I had. I think one of the main things that kind of prevents people is kind of just being intimidated by professors or lab assistants um, when actually approaching them for opportunities. I think that um, you know, don't let that hold you back. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, you don't have to be an expert in the subject. You don't have to. You don't even need to have research experience. When I was a freshman um, applying to meet labs, I didn't have any prior research experience. I think um, professors and lab PIs are more interested in knowing whether you're um, interested in learning about the work that they do and really willing to put in the time and effort to learn what you don't know. So um, more than your experience, that's what's important. Um, yeah, and again, like I mentioned, um, being at UCSD, you know, there's some really amazing research going on, so make use of your opportunities. Um, even if you don't know what field you're going into, just um, this is a great way to get first-time experience and kind of make a more informed decision about you know, possible career paths. Um, as for applying to labs specifically, so I mentioned I found, about, I found out about meet labs through a senior. Um, you can also you know, use Handshake, um, the real portal. And personally, what I found to be effective is emailing professors directly. Um, and of course, remember to you know, show your genuine interest, read up on their publications and the lab work. And um, yeah. For the wearable headset to assess one's mental state or mental health. Who are the targeted audience for this headset? Is the end goal to have everyone using the headset or is it only for a certain group of people who might be taking like antidepressants and that will be like the main audience or the main users for your product? Um, we are all inclusive. So um, everyone coming into the lab gets to do this in the first week that they join the lab and also, um, and then they have their friend circle and so on. That's how we build um, the setups. Of course, we uh, also have studies and patients as well, but we want to have sort of a, an understanding of neural processing, underlying cognition across the mental health spectrum, across lifespan. So again, um, Dylan's next paper we're actually submitting this weekend would be on comparing um, healthy aging and uh, healthy young adults' abilities of cognition. And uh, like Aditi said, she's working on a climate change project. And that's, um, yeah, so we're not, it, it's not about any um, specific, um, you know, circuit. We want to be able to characterize this broad base of processing and then, then we put them into different um, project flow side depending on basically the interests of our team members, um, current issues that are relevant to society and so on. Yeah, so I guess another question we have is, this is open to Julian, Aditi, or Dr. Mishra. So Dr. Mishra mentioned about the animal study being done in Nila, and I'm just really interested and curious, how is animal research related to individual behavior and how studying of animal can advance the field of neurocognition? Um, do you want me to take that, Julian, Aditi? 
Okay. Um, yes, I think, you know, we, we can do a lot more, um, you know, invasively in animals, of course, with properly approved ethical protocols, but we can really get at the understanding of um, neural circuits at a much deeper level than we would otherwise in humans. Um, and, and that's what we get at with animals doing similar um, cognitive tasks uh, as humans would. Um, some of the things that our lab has pioneered, again, in the animal space is that in order to simulate what humans do, they have, um, they've made automated behavioral chambers where animals are able to do these um, cognitive functions just like humans do. And animals are also uh, being recorded from um, a large array of brain regions. If you actually see the animal literature in neural processing, usually people record from one or two parts of the brain, but not exactly networks of multiple brain regions. And so um, you get this uh, really rich understanding of this multiplexing that's happening um, across species and something that is um, you know, preserved across species. We then understand how that's much more important because ev with evolution across species, we still see that, that being preserved. And sometimes there are differences, uh, but it's nice to highlight both. Okay, we have a question in the chat. So first, thank you for your amazing presentation again. And the participant wants to know how one can learn more about MATLAB and the e and EEG in general. Yeah, Dylan, you can take that because you've been teaching all of this. Yeah, um, we do like a little boot camp with our um, lab interns. But if you go to MathWorks, there's also a bunch of EEG lab tutorials um, with YouTube videos and practice data sets to help you do every single step of the analysis. Um, we have a pipeline that automates all of it, but you can learn how to do every single manual step and like what every manual step means. Yeah, hope that answered your question. We have another question. How do you compare or correlate ERS and the ERP data presented in the slide? Um, so we do, so ERPs are event-related potentials, which means that, you know, when you record an EEG and you lock it to specific cognitive events, you'll see that the voltage signal either goes positive or negative, and that's what an ERP is. Um, underlying the ERP uh, in the brain, we have understood over time that there is processing that happens in different frequencies, and these, they're very, you know, canonical frequencies. This happens, you might have heard of them. There's beta band, alpha band, beta band, and so on. Um, and in these bands, uh, what it's, why it's exciting to look at those bands is that you can really tell whether um, at these frequencies, the underlying neural populations, they're synchronizing together. So usually when you're trying to process information, you see a lot of neurons firing at the same time in a specific brain region, so they synchronize. Uh, or desynchronize. Um, synchronization is sometimes a really great signal uh, of long distance, um, uh, you know, the combination of neurons talking to each other over long distances, whereas desynchronization happens when you're just about to take in new information and you don't want to lock to listening to other parts of the brain, but you want to lock to what's incoming as sensory inputs. Um, so anyways, you, so the ERP can be, um, uh, can be disentangled uh, through, uh, uh, you know, power spectrum transforms into different frequencies in which you can then um, see what is synchronizing versus not synchronizing. And that is part of our standard analyses. Yeah, thank you. So this question probably is for Jillian for her research of loneliness versus wisdom. So the question is, how do you quantitatively measure one's loneliness and wisdom? Yeah, so we use um, standardized scales. Uh, I think UCLA developed the loneliness one and UCSD developed the wisdom. Um, wisdom is more recently developed. It's um, a very broad construct, but there's different components like empathy, um, decisiveness, self-awareness. Um, forget the other ones off the top of my head, but then, um, and then loneliness is not only like how often you talk to other people, but how um, how much support you feel like you have in relation to other people. So it's a little bit irrespective of social network size. Um, it's more how you personally feel you're supported by your social network. Yeah, so I think a follow-up question to this is how does one study self-reported scores on tests like the mental health exams or other sort of you know tests to, to keep track of one's wisdom score or like mood score? Because these scores are somewhat subjective and it might be challenging to find statistical significance with these methods. Yeah, so they, yeah, they are subjective scores, um, but yeah, and that's a limitation of our study because it's hard to find objective measures of loneliness or wisdom in an individual that you don't know. Um, but we use pretty standardized scores for anxiety and depression as well, um, like DSM scores that are used in clinicians' offices as well. Um, but yeah, that is a limitation of having a self-report score. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, just a slide right after this. Um, so my question was about um, theta here, theta, beta, and alpha. Um, so this is the power of, of each of those frequency bands, um, and it, it seems like it's in a, a negative to positive scale. So how, how are you normalizing that, and what, what value do you choose? Uh, do you want to take that, or should I? Do you mean, like, how do you normalize the EEG data? Well, so um, I guess, tell me about how your power in this, for example, in the first figure, theta, you get theta uh, from your spectral density, right? Um, and then I see that it goes negative to positive. So I'm just curious about how you're setting your, your zero value. Yeah, Jenny might be able to speak better to the algorithm. Yeah, actually, in this one, I think, uh, actually, you just want to know, um, basically, in this particular study, we, we did record um, across the lifespan. So different people can have different uh, processing speeds and whatnot in the context of different kinds of stimuli. We had angry stimuli, happy stimuli, and whatnot. So what we did was normalize the processing to what's happening on neutral emotion stimuli for everyone. Um, and that's where you, we will get, get a differential. And that's why, um, relative to a neutral emotion, you could have positive power or negative power. Um, and that's important to do because, you know, given any person, may, you and I may be different for several different reasons. So you want to have a conditional control in, in, it, in there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just a few other like quick follow-up questions here. Uh, how many subjects did you have for this trial? I believe it's 150. Yeah, and it's 47, I think. Okay, wow. And um, I see that you draw this regression pipeline um, with a similar slope across all. Is that um, is that calculated to be the, the best fit, or is that kind of uh, what what you uh, think is is kind of the, the correct relationship? It's calculated as the robust fit. I see. So how, how could you explain the kind of what looks to be large variation between um, between trials between subjects? 
Um, they're all different, as you will see from the different brain areas, different um, on also different brain areas on the x-axis and different subjective scores on the y-axis relative for loneliness versus wisdom in the bottom. So that would add to the, the variance. The point of the paper really was that in different um, emotional contexts, um, depending on how we identify as um, you know self-report ourselves to be socially um, either feeling inhibited, which is what loneliness is like, like even, even if you may have a great friend circle, you may still feel like you, you're, you're isolated or you don't belong or whatever. But the context of being um, lonely versus the, the, the feelings of being um, more pro-social, which is what wisdom reflects, um, that contrast comes up with sort of how you implicitly process emotions. So the task that we presented to individuals in this paper, as Julian uh, showed in the slide before, it was just very implicit processing of emotions. Participants just saw happy faces, angry faces, um, you know, neutral faces, sad faces just flow by. And they weren't actually making any active decisions on those faces, but their brains were processing those faces differently. Um, and that related to their subjective social uh, experience, which is uh, which is reflected by the loneliness and wisdom skills. Okay, I see. Thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. Just final quick question would be, um, we, with, with EG, right, you, you're kind of uh, far from the actual firing of action potentials and, and the number of channels you can fit on the scalp are also a limitation. And, um, it looked like your headset was maybe a dry, dry headset. Um, my, my question is, how, how much can you actually infer about the neural circuits? Um, or, or is it that um, the neural circuits uh, are, are generated by deep brain type of studies and then um, the EG data is fit to that? Um, no, I think it's, it's it's a combination, and that's partly why we're motivated to do um, the animal work as well in terms of seeing uh, what is preserved across species. Um, we do see a lot of preservation uh, uh, in terms of circuitry, uh, and we... Uh, like I was presenting in a few slides earlier than this, uh, some, some of the um, innovations we've done in terms of, um, you know, these uh, um, automated algorithms, which are in this slide that an ECE student worked on, so is that we want to be able to analyze the data in brain space more than in channel space and to get at more advanced uh, ways of doing that than that has been done in the literature before. So one of the, um, just to get at, just in, in, in very briefly, one of the things that Ali uh, really innovated on is that most um, algorithms that localize or say the scalp perturbation is coming from the brain in a certain way, they are going to model it um, by this, this, can you see my arrow? So this is the, um, you know, this, this head ball on, on the left, but the brain data gets localized everywhere, even to regions outside the scalp. And but that's not really biologically constrained. How can you have brain activity coming from outside the scalp? So his algorithms really went on to add on biological, greater biological constraints to existing algorithms so that the so that the plane in which the data gets localized is within the brain. And eventually what that yields is these focal activations um, in certain cortical areas that are uh, more precise than prior methods that don't do these biological constraints onto the data. So um, this is the long and short of it is that, um, yes, EEG is not precise. We're doing semi-dry, not, not completely dry, because I agree that completely dry recordings can be unreliable. Uh, but the semi-dry recordings are pretty good, and they don't, um, they're not uh, as unreliable as dry, and they're not as tedious as wet. So they're really nice um, in between to go to. And then the, the analyses in source space help us to really pin down um, sort of these circuit dynamics between brain areas a little bit more than just doing it on scalp space. Um, and then it's important for us to relate it to what's happening inside brains when people are actually recording inside brains. And um, of course, we try to do that with the literature that comes in our papers, but also by inventing some of these animal studies alongside. All right, so I'll be introducing you to briefly about the ISN lab. So ISN lab has been in existence since 1994. Over the years, UCSD, uh, Integrated Systems Neuro Engineering, which uh, is what ISN stands for, has pioneered and refined engineering of micropower silicon integrated circuits with a mission of remediating neurological disease and advancing the understanding of cognitive brain function. ISN has been making inroads in interfacing to biological neural systems on larger and finer scale. Also, ISN offered a range of cross-cutting courses that engage students in the practice of integrated circuit design across micropower, power instrumentation, machine learning, and computational intelligence. So I'll be introducing to you about uh, the speakers for today. So first, we have Ashley Paul, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Bioengineering at UCSD. His research focuses on studying brain and body health through the design and development of unobtrusive sensing interfaces. During his time in the graduate program at UCSD, Ashley has had the opportunity to work in collaboration with labs in the ECE, nanoengineering, and cognitive sciences, as well as external partnerships with the industry and the Department of Defense. He's part of the ISN lab led by Professor Kirk Cohenberg. The lab has demonstrated neuromorphic neural network hardware, biologically inspired dynamic version, uh, vision sensors, and high-performance neural simulation and recording systems. Uh, we also have Alice Tor, who is currently a research assistant in ISN. She's currently a third-year undergraduate majoring in bioengineering, and her research focuses on signal processing techniques. So please help me welcome uh, Ashley Paul, who's first going to present about his research in the ISN. Lab. Okay, so my talk today is just quickly going to kind of introduce some of the work going on in our lab, as well as like what my focus is. Um, most of it is EEG, but we also work on other implementations of, of neural interfaces. Um, the best way to talk about our lab is to actually look at kind of what we produce. Um, and what we produce over the years are, are microchips. And these microchips uh, can be thought of as um, biologically inspired uh, application-specific chips um, for either uh, simulating the brain um, uh, or recording directly from the brain. Um, so on the left, we see two examples of, of chips that are neuro-inspired to uh, kind of replicate some functions of the brain. Um, so NeuroDIN, for example, is, is quite an old project now, 15 years old, it's gone through some iterations. Um, essentially what we do in hardware is we can model very accurately to biology for neurons. And those neurons are connected to each other by chemical junctions called synapses, and then also um, electrical junctions, I think called gap junctions. Um, and, and basically we can program in the ion conductances, the membrane potentials, and the weights of all of these uh, connections. And then basically assign it a very simple task, like processing a single pixel of information or a few pixels of information um, or um, a few milliseconds of uh, temporal data, for example. Um, this is a scalable technique. So we're showing four here, um, but we're able to um, to make a single hardware in, um, instantiations of this, which can be several hundred thousand neurons. And our latest work are, um, I think, 1.7 billion neurons. Um, and that, that hardware is available for use through the SD Supercomputer Center, which is on campus. If you're interested in that, I can connect you to one of our lab scientists. Um, the second chip is quite interesting. It's actually, um, it can be thought of as an artificial retina. The way it works is very similar to um, a conventional CMOS imager, like the one that you would find in, in, your, in your cell phone behind the lens. Um, it's light sensitive 
but the way that it processes the light information is different. Um, specifically, it operates in the way that the, um, the neurons in the, in the layers of the retina work in that it really only processes new information that hits the retina. So if, um, if you look at this pinwheel experiment here, we're spinning the pinwheel at, at, uh, at different speeds here, and it really it's processing only the information um, of the, um, well, there's also a range, right? If it's spinning too fast, we can't see it, it's blurred, um, but it's, it's really processing the edges of, of the spinning um, pinwheel. So I need a simpler way to, to visualize that is when someone is putting their hand in front of the camera, in front of the imager, and they move their hand left, we can see um, kind of the negative and positive outlines of the hand. This is similar to the way the eye processes information. If the hand is still in front of the eye, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't see anything actually. The, the brain will hold on to that last image that we see. Um, okay, on the right is a little more related to what I work on, and that's actually biosensing. So here we have two uh, low power, high performance bioamplifier chips. So this particular one is 16 channels, one by one millimeter, and then we have a larger array here. Um, this one was either 256 or uh, 1024, oops. And there's basically two uh, versions of this. So the idea of both of these is that we, we can apply them to different neural interfaces. So if you're looking for um, more of a broken out, uh, unobtrusive sensing, you could use this low power chip that we have and really get uh, record breaking performance for scalp EEG recording, epidural ECOG, or even subdural ECOG. Um, if you wanted to take it a step further and have extremely high density of, of real recording sites, um, very close to uh, you know, the actual firing of the neurons, you could take a chip like this and adapt the Utah rate to it, for example, and then get cortical uh, actual potential recordings. You could also make a flexible ECOG that, that fits on the surface of the brain. More particularly, what we're interested in is actually putting the chips directly on the cortex to measure local field potentials in what's called modular ECOG or um, colloquially known as neural grains or neural dust. Um, there are a bunch of different names on that. Um, but to take a step back, what, what I think is maybe most applicable to, to this talk is some of our work with non-contact and dry contact uh, sensors. So Mike Chi, about 10 years ago, pioneered um, this dry contact, non-contact technology. It can really be placed anywhere on the surface of the body and provides you know, high fidelity EEG, ECG, and other, um, other sensors, um, uh, sorry, other, other signals. Um, and it all comes down to, again, uh, some IC technology, a chip that was made called an infinite, infinite impedance um, amplifier, which allows us to record in these non-ideal conditions. Um, and these, you know, these technologies have now been commercialized and, and can be purchased. Um, so Cognionics is a San Diego company that um, makes these dry contact scalp headsets, and then they also make a version of ear EEG, which, um, as was mentioned, is kind of more the, the focus of this talk. Um, but before we get there, we can talk a little bit about the application of these chips for also invasive deep brain measurements. So we've taken this chip called BioADC, which has 30, sorry, 16 channels. It operates at one microvolt RMS and preferred noise, has nine decibels of dynamic range, um, and it's, you know, it has an extremely small footprint, one square millimeter, will only consume one microwatt of power. Um, and so here we see that we're interfacing with the Neuralink's electrode system in, in the brain of a marmoset. And then the marmoset is um, asked to complete some type of task. And we are kind of recording that information with, with really high fidelity. And we compare it to a commercial system called the Intan system, shown here. Um, so you can see the difference, right? The Intan system is kind of this really large, bulky wire setup, whereas our device can really fit underneath the stereotactic probe. Um, and just to skip quickly over this, we're also hoping to achieve wireless neural interfacing, similar to what Neuralink has, but um, in an even small form factor. Essentially, you can build the interface into the chip itself and send power and data over the same wireless interface. Um, so in collaboration with other labs, we've made uh, MEMS piezoelectric neural interfaces as well. This particular one was used in a CAT model for um, measuring from cochlear nerves, I believe. Um, so here you can see what's called the auditory brain stem response, ABR. So if, um, if you're familiar with ABR, you know, peaks one, three, and four, one, three, and five are, are important for assessing hearing health. Um, and then with some of our newer collaborations we're working with, uh, people in the nanoengineering department to actually take our chips, our technologies, and make them flexible. So that rather than uh, something like this, which is rigid from 10 years ago, um, it's something that looks, feels, and, and performs like skin. Um, so there's a new chip uh, as one that I developed last year in, in, in the suite. So it's 32 channels. Um, it's very low power. It's called a NISOC. And what we're actually hoping to do with this is make this available to our collaborators here at UCSD and, and beyond. Um, why you'd want to use this potentially over your existing commercial systems is uh, the footprint, right? It's, it's uh, smaller and wearable. Um, but mainly because this also provides uh, voltage and current clamping capabilities. Uh, so just briefly, um, in, in neurosciences, it can be useful sometimes to, for you know, at least a single neuron, um, drive the neuron to a single voltage and then measure the current over time or fix the current, basically sync it to a fixed value and then measure voltage over time. So those two profiles really tell you a lot about um, you know, ion gating uh, potentials and, and conductances in the neuron. And, and really sometimes can be the foundation for um, figuring out what are the neural circuits in, in the brain. Um, and I'm happy to report that this trip is slowly becoming available. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, um, feel free to reach out. Um, and now to talk about your EEG, we first look at EEG. Um, so this is me sitting at the Schwartz Center, um, the SCCN, where we have um, a Faraday kind of isolated room, um, an SSVP setup, and then I think it's a 128 channel wet EEG and a bio semi um, system. So this is conventionally what really like research, research rate EEG looks like. And it can be difficult to use, especially because the subject has to really conform to the setup. Um, something that we started to, to do um, a few years ago was to see if we could bring EEG to hearing devices or hearables. And it all started with um, this collaboration we had with a hearing aid company. The idea they had is um, hearing aids kind of work uh, in one direction. They, they amplify sound based on a pre-recorded profile, um, but they don't really get any input um, from the subject. Sure, some of them have apps and stuff, but there's a difference between hearing and perception. Um, and the goal of this collaboration was that we would build um, a device that sits in the ear has electrodes on it that also detects from the sound perception regions of the brain, like the auditory cortex. Um, I think the temporal parietal lobes also have some play there. Um, and, and really the, the broad goal was that we would build um, brain sensing techniques into a device that's worn by a lot of people 65 years and, and over. And as the global population ages, there'd be more need for this type of closed loop um, uh, wearable. So yes, is it easily possible to measure EEG from, from the ear or ear canal? The short answer is yes. Um, there's a nice diagram from this paper by Nguyen where they're able to show that 
from earplugs placed inside the ear, you know, you can detect eye movements, jaw movements, EMG, um, and of course EEG, because the actual distance between certain parts of the ear canal and certain parts of the brain are equal to or even less than what you can get at the, at the surface. So surface electrodes really are great for looking at the top of the cortex, but from inside the ear canal, we really get, um, uh, we really get directions coming from the temporal lobe and the middle brain and the brain stem that aren't really possible from, from scalp. Um, but just taking a step back and looking at kind of what are the capabilities of our lab and how we would achieve this, we, we have fabrication capabilities, um, you know, basic 3D printing, but also more serious things like MEMS and, and nano. Um, and we can also work with electrochemistry. And, and we were quickly able to make an in-ear sensor like this, of course, wired to begin with. And in some place where we kind of excel is the circuits, right? Um, so we were quickly able to put together a Raspberry Pi powered ADS-1299 uh, 32 channel system. And, and we're able to measure signals from the ear. So this is, these are signals from the ear. Um, in this case, the right ear was um, seeing some different uh, stimuli from the, from the left. Um, so this slide really is, is to demonstrate kind of all the, all the, all the things that we utilize to, to make this happen. Um, so obviously like a uh, MATLAB Python, uh, some machine learning and modeling going into, into all of this. Um, looking at ear EEG more closely, there are three regions of the ear which are of interest when measuring. Um, the first one being the most exciting is inside the ear canal. In this case, we put eight silver chloride electrodes inside the ear canal. These are two millimeter diameter dry contact. And then the outer ear, which is called the outer portion of the ear canal, which is called the contra cavum. Um, we have more sparsely placed electrodes. Um, we also detect the ejectivity from here. However, it's, it's weaker. And then the contra cavum, which um, if you were to look at your ear, is actually over a ridge, um, has virtually no ejectivity and actually serves as a great place for reference and in, in driven right leg. Um, looking at the ear from this cross section, um, there are hearing devices such as this one. Uh, this is a hearing aid where the amplifier is placed behind the ear and then the, um, the transducer is inside the ear canal. Um, we see that for the most part, discrete devices that are worn, um, the best contact with the skin would actually occur inside the ear canal. Um, and so kind of going forward, our focus has been putting as many uh, electrodes inside the ear canal as possible while maintaining some electrodes outside as well. And I'll tell you why we still keep electrodes outside despite the best EG signal coming from inside the ear canal. Um, and that has to do with what's called um, EDA, electrodermal activity. Um, and that the, best, the best way to define what that is is to give an example of how it's used. So EDA is the physiological response to stimuli. Um, with uh, basically small amounts of sweat forming on the skin. So light detector tests, uh, that's how they work. They'll put two electrodes on your, on your hand. And if, if you're lying, you know, then it kind of gives your body a little bit of stress and your palm gets sweaty, even undetectably to, to subjects. The same phenomenon happens on, in the inner and outer portions of the tragus in the ear. So that's, there's more information we can provide to the user um, about their mental health is also by leveraging their, their physiology overall. Um, and so some of the results that we got a few years ago are summarized here. We, obviously we get auditory ERP type data in, in the time domain, in the frequency domain, we're able to detect um, steady state auditory stimuli, ASSR, um, across ranges, in this case, 20 to 100 Hertz, we're able to uh, pick up these steady state frequencies in the brain. And um, like the last uh, lab was describing, these all have to do with synchronous firing in the brain. The reason why these peaks are so distinct is because large parts of the brain are firing in synchrony. Um, so this, this can tell us actually a lot about the hearing health of a subject, which is important uh, towards making a smart hearing aid. Um, but these can also tell us a lot about the actual pathway of the brain and assess things like progressive neurodegenerative disease, myelination disease, for example, would change these peak frequencies. And um, you know, these could be of value also to um, other researchers, right? Like for example, loneliness, I guess, could, could, could be detected by looking at these peaks, um, just not with the sound stimulus. Electrodermal activity, like I said, we compared to the pump. Um, so we saw that inside the ear canal, we do see a slower response of uh, skin conductivity. So skin impedance drops. And here the drop on the control was uh, a lot sharper, obviously, because this is on the hand. Um, so we, we made some cool uh, findings here. Basically the ear wax in the ear slows down the progression of sweat to the actual electrodes. We also see um, really high impedances between the dry contact, the dry electrode and, and, and the skin because of wax and because of the dry conditions of the ear for the most part. Um, so we've done some interesting things to compensate for high impedance at that interface. Um, I want to briefly introduce ASSR before I end because I know Alice is gonna talk more about this. Um, so ASSR generally just has to do with uh, this, the, the presentation of sound to the subject's ear um, and then the sound is, is encoded and becomes neural signals which are processed in um, these parts of the brain. If you, if you present a repeating steady state signal like this, um, whatever the carrier frequency is, you expect to actually see that in the EEG signal. So this is sound, this is EEG, we're seeing in FFT here, uh, the presence of, of this uh, frequency that's coming in. In terms of a smart hearing aid, right, this was important because we have, we have a speaker in the hearing aid, we have electrodes now in the hearing aid, which detect from the brain. Um, so we wanted to see what was the interplay between a steady state and um, a steady state uh, time, uh, time domain auditory signal and the uh, representation of that signal in the brain in the frequency domain. Um, so we did some experiments with the, the dry headset as well and compared it to the ear. Um, I'm going to let Alice talk, talk more about that. But essentially, we, we see with some comparable quality the same signal from inside the ear canal as on from certain channels on, on the scalp. Um, so just to conclude, um, if you have any more questions or, or would like to maybe collaborate on anything, please feel free to reach out to our professor, uh, Greg Kellenberg. That's his email address. Below that is uh, the link to our website. Um, and then there's also my email and also Alice's. Great, okay, awesome. So yeah, as Dr. mentioned, um, I'm currently an undergrad researcher at the ISM lab. Um, and I'll be focusing the first part of my presentation on EEG ASSR analysis. Um, I'll kind of just uh, skim over this part because I'm sure you guys are all well familiar with EEG by this point. Basically, it measures um, uh, electric potentials generated by firing neurons in the brain, and lots of neurons are in, 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 in synchronicity. Um, it creates a local field potential that can be picked up by electrodes um, either on the scalp or in the ear or around the head. Um, and traditionally, wet electrode headsets are used, like the one shown on the right here. Um, but you can see that they're very—they're um, not very user friendly. Um, you can't really take them places. They don't look very comfortable. Um, and thanks to developments um, in technology at the ISN, dry electrode headsets like the Cognos Quick 30 um, have been able to be developed, which is uh, what's being shown here. Um, and the NR EEG device is also being developed, and that's also really amazing. So uh, again, as Ashley mentioned, um, the auditory steady state response, or the ASSR, is an electrophysiological response to auditory stimuli. And it originates in your primary auditory cortex, which, as you can see, um, 
is sort of this area in your brain above the ears, and the stimuli originate spatially based on frequency. So, like a 500 hertz stimuli will um, cause a different part of your brain to activate than, say, like a 2000 hertz stimuli. Um, and then the stimuli, when you design it, is usually a signal designed to activate a specific part of the um, primary auditory cortex, uh, modulated by some lower frequency carrier signal. So, uh, in this uh, diagram, you can see that uh, there's a uniform direction white noise, um, which has uh, average power across all frequencies, so it actually activates your entire primary auditory cortex. And this is modulated by a 20 hertz sine wave to give you a 40 hertz stimuli. All right, and uh, just to give some mathematical background, Fourier series, um, or Fourier theorem, as I'm sure you've heard of it, you take any basic signal processing course, basically states that any PRF signal that meets the Dirichlet condition, so any signal that can be generated in the lab, can always be written as a sum of sinusoids. Um, and we can apply this to EEG data because this allows us to reconstruct EEG data as a sum of different signals with different amplitudes, or as a sum of different frequency signals with different amplitudes. Um, and when EEG data is being uh, analyzed, it's first broken up into time windows. Um, and uh, but when we break up uh, EEG data into discrete time windows like this, you get discontinuities at the edges of your data. Um, and this is called the Gibson phenomenon. You can see it's kind of chunky over here and here. Um, and to help deal with this, we taper the data, which uh, is when we multiply the signal by uh, some sort of taper, for example, a uniform Gaussian distribution, which you can see um, here. And this allows us to obtain a smoother signal, and this uh, helps the Fourier transform run better. Um, you can see that it's much smoother at the edges. However, this does result in data loss because um, we are losing the data at the edges of our signal, as well as accidentally amplifying the signal in the middle of our um, in the middle of our time window. And to help prevent data loss, we can do two things: we can add overlap to our uh, time window and this helps reduce the amount of data that we're losing at the edges. And we can also increase the window size, which helps increase the uh, frequency resolution of the Fourier transform. Um, and in practice, window size should allow for at least 70, um, 70 windows from your data set. Um, and uh, here's an example of power spectrum. Hopefully this makes uh, it clear what I was talking about. Um, you guys are all familiar with brain waves, as I'm certain. Um, and for this experiment, uh, users were asked to sit in a dark room um, with their eyes closed, listening to uh, the ASSR stimuli. So we're not really seeing gamma waves, which would occur during active learning and when the brain is really focused and engaged. But we are seeing beta waves at around 20 hertz right here, which indicate normal consciousness. We're also seeing alpha waves at around um, 10 hertz, uh, which indicates that the subject was in a state of relaxation. We're not seeing theta or delta waves because these usually occur when the subject is asleep. And then we're also seeing the ASSR, um, response, or the ASSR signal right at 40 hertz, since they were played at 40 hertz ASSR stimuli. Um, yeah, so as Neat Labs also mentioned, uh, you can use EEG Lab, which is a free MATLAB toolbox to help you analyze your data. Um, it was developed at UCSD, which I think is pretty cool. There's a lot of resources online to help you learn it. Um, and it primarily uses Fulch's method to analyze EEG data. Um, this method uh, first uh, windows and tapers your EEG data. I believe it uses a handing taper. Um, and then it applies a fast Fourier transform to uh, obtain amplitude and frequency information. From this amplitude and frequency information, you can obtain a power spectrum by weighting the corresponding frequencies based on the amplitude. Right. So here's some experimental data. Um, this was from the Cognomics Quick 30 headset, so a 30 channel dry electrode headset. And the stimuli being played to the uh, subject was 500, five, or not 500 hertz, it was just regular white noise modulated at 40 hertz. Um, and as you can see with the small window size, um, you don't really see, like the ASSR you can still see, but it's very small. When you increase the window size, the frequency resolution um, increases dramatically. Um, you can see a lot more peaks start to form, um, but they kind of swallow the ASSR signal. Finally, we see the clearest response when we have both a larger window size and an overlap in our windows. Um, and it's still here at 40 hertz. Um, here's some more experimental data. This was obtained using a 256 channel wet electric headset. And in this experiment, the subject was being played 500 hertz chair tone carrier noise modulated at 40 hertz again. Um, and again, when we have a small window, there's not much of an ASSR uh, response that you can clearly see. Um, but when we increase uh, the window size, the frequency resolution does shoot up. Um, and when we have a small window and overlap, again, you can't really see the uh, ASSR response. It does be begin to start to form, um, especially here at the pink end, you can see it. But we do see the clear signal when we have a larger window and uh, overlap in our windowing. So we can compare these two data sets to uh, sort of um, sort of assess how good the dry electric headset is. Um, and overall, we do see that the wet electric headset has a higher signal to noise ratio or SNR. Um, and it might not seem that way because the signal is still pretty small. Um, but this is uh, it, uh, these graphs um, graph the log power um, instead of just the regular power. So when you estimate the noise floor and the peak of the signal of interest, you can uh, calculate a gain or you can calculate a power gain of around 3.1, which uh, is an SNR of five decibels. Um, and for the dry electric headset, we can calculate a SNR around three decibels. And we like seeing a higher SNR. But even though the uh, wet electric headset has this higher SNR, we're still able to see that the dry electric headset is able to pick up the signal of interest. Um, you can also uh, use uh, EG Lab to figure out where the signal is orig originating on a scalp map. Um, this is a simplistic scalp map. Um, it's from a bird's eye view. You can see the ears right here and the nose right here. Um, and in both of these graphs, you can see that the ASSR frequency of 40 hertz is being picked up in the primary auditory cortex region above the ears. Um, notably, the 256 channel experiment only played 500 hertz ASSR stimuli, which means that um, since this was just one frequency, it would have activated a much uh, smaller part of the primary auditory cortex. Um, and the stimuli was also played in the left ear only, which means that only the right auditory cortex is being activated. Um, so that's why we also see it only really originating here um, instead of on both sides in the dry headset experiment. Um, also, because the 256 channel uh, system has a much greater electrode density, it's able to pick up a much more precise location um, on the scalp. Um, so uh, that's also why we see a smaller um, red area on the scalp map. However, again, we're able to see that both systems are able to pick up useful information. Um, and this is uh, this is this is promising for dry electric headsets for brain computer interfaces because you know we're both are useful, um, but one is much more convenient um, and user friendly. You don't have to shake your head to use um, the dry electric headset, for example. All right. Um, so I'll be talking about undergraduate research opportunities now. Uh, just to give some uh, background on how I got involved with the ISN, um, I've been working on this neurofeedback project with the EG Data Analysis for with a couple other under, with a couple other undergrads um, for a little bit now. Um, we're currently working on sound design um, and stimuli design for the ASSR response. And I first got this uh, got involved by sending a cold email to Dr. Kurt Kahnberg, who was also mentioned as the director of the ISN, and he connected me to Akshay Min, who have been the grad students that I've been in primary contact with. I'm currently taking A199 for research credit um, uh, with Dr. Kahnberg, and uh, some relevant classes that I think were useful to what I'm doing now include EC45, or really any um, basic signal processing course, Day 180, which is a bioinformation course, and Day 162, which is a biosyst
So relevant skills do include uh, basic, having a basic knowledge of signal processing as well as electrophysiology, um, also having a basic understanding of instrumentation health, and knowing uh, how to read and write MATLAB code uh, is also useful. Um, so I know this is parroting a lot of what was said at the end of the MATLAB talk, but if you do want to get involved in undergrad research, there are plenty of resources at UCSD that I think are really helpful. Um, the real portal, the handshake portal, uh, I've gotten positions through both of these um, portals. Uh, I think that they're great because they make the incentive, whether it be like credit or getting paid um, through these positions, they make those uh, incentives really clear. Um, but again, as Adesi mentioned, uh, cold emails are really great. Um, as, or yeah, I got the position for cold email. Um, and, uh, yeah, you're obviously gonna get like rejected and posted a lot, but uh, that shouldn't stop you from trying. Um, student orgs are also great. Oh, like EMS posts when labs are looking for um, or when labs are looking for undergrad researchers. Um, I, I think we also post. Uh, I'm sure other labs or other orgs post as well. And then classes are also a great way to get uh, more involved with it, what a professor is doing or a professor and um, start that dialogue. The Charles program is more for if you're already doing undergrad research. It's a scholarship program. I've gone to a couple of years, not for work with ISN, but um, uh, my first two years of undergrad, I did research with a different lab, and uh, it's really great. Um, it's just money if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, and the AP, I think it's called the Undergrad Research uh, Department now, also has a lot more resources if you're interested in um, seeing what UCSD has offered in terms of scholarships um, and other research resources for uh, getting involved or getting support for undergrad research. Right. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you, actually, and Alice, for your presentation. So we'll be moving on to the Q&A now. Um, I think Simon had a few questions to ask, so if you want to mute Simon and ask your questions. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe like, uh, uh, maybe more the first question, I was asking if it was multilateral array, and I saw that it could be applied to multilateral array or like um, neural desk. So I guess, you know that question? Um, I guess my first question is like, um, so uh, not neuromorphic, um, so like the, um, so for actually you mentioned um, studies being done on neuromorphic chips. Um, and I've heard something called uh, neural, neurons on a chip, uh, chip, or I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking um, if the training paradigms used for neuro neuromorphic chips can be translated to like actual bowel neurons on a chip. I've heard some people, some researchers were able to like train it or something to, to be able to fly a simulated airplane, which is quite amazing. Um, and I was, yeah, I was wondering if the same, I guess, training protocol can be used for neurons on a chip or like other artificial uh, neuron clusters. So yeah, I, I think I think your, your thinking is correct. It's possible, and there are some specific demonstrations of this application. Um, I, I think so. Some of the advantages of using a hardware simulating neuron, like NeuroDIN, right, the first chip on the left on the screen, um, is that you can be a little more exploratory. Um, there are certain things you can do with a hardware chip that you can try to kind of define your space um, that would probably end up killing your real neurons, right? You also have a limited number of time, uh, limited time with the neurons generally, real neurons, right? And they're all they're also depending on how they're derived. They come from like iPS stem cells. Um, they are changing, right? Day to day, the firing will be different. So. Yes, generally, that was the idea, is that you would first uh, try out your ideas for training real neurons in Neurodin, or you can even take a step further back, or you would, you would take a GPU-ready model or something, something that's been trained on the PC and software. Um, and there are ways to translate that into the parameters that go into Neurodin, right? Those are like for each training cycle, how the weights are updated, how the synapses are formed or, or destroyed. Um, in that case, you know, just turn on and off. We don't actually destroy anything. Um, and then uh, how many cycles and iterations um, are, 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 are translated from the, the software to the hardware, because the hardware is going to be a bit slower, right? And then from there, what you can do is arrange four neurons in a dish in a, in a similar way, and, and hope that some of those things translate. And in some cases, they do. Now, I think a real robust, um, a real robust application for Neurodin is having Neurodin speak speak to real neurons in in, in situ. So, um, for example, like you can cut a slice of the brain from from a mouse um, that, uh, and, and, and you, you have some idea of the neural circuit in that brain already, and then you can you can connect it using your array microelectrode array to Neurodin, and then using Neurodin, you can first of all communicate back and forth. And neither Neurodin nor the slice of brain really knows that it's talking to something different than itself, right? It's kind of uh, we had some paper where these. Um, we basically pass the neuromorphic Turing test. So if real neurons can't tell that they're talking to artificial neurons these days. Okay, then the, um, the neurodin itself, because it, it communicates on chip, just like neurons would, can be then used to maybe modulate those circuits that are already in place in the mouse brain. You could potentially change them. Um, but beyond that, I don't, I don't really know. I had heard of, of things like uh, a few neurons, like operating a navigation system on a drone or something. But um, I think the real challenge there is how do you grow four neurons or 10 neurons such that they, they form a biologically relevant neuron? That's a bit like a material science challenge. I, um, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> It's pretty interesting. I just thought like the, the way you mentioned putting biodim inside the brain as like a kind of like um, just fooling the brain to thinking it's actual cluster of neurons. I was also thinking like you have multilateral array chips. Yeah. Uh, what if you just stack the, the actual chips onto the neurodin? So like you can program that and with the same um, multilateral chips using the same programming pro protocol and putting that on like actual neurons on the chip. So like you have then you have yourself like a programming automatic programming device. I don't know if that would work. Just uh, an idea that popped up. Yeah, mind. that's a very good idea. And I can introduce you to, to the two PhD students in the lab working on that. The project is called NeuroCube, um, and it's leveraging exactly what you said. Both of those systems to create. Um, to create a robust interface with the neurons, right? Because we can record and simulate, stimulate, right? We talked about clamping and, and so forth. And then on that back end, yes, we can stack neurodin chips. Um, and then the neurodin chips are stackable such that, like I said, you know, you can have just four neurons or like um, scaled into billions. So it's amazing. Um, th thank you uh, for your insight. Sure. Uh, I guess a uh, second question is like, uh, um, I don't know if it's more relevant for, actually, uh, for you or Alice. Um, so, like, uh, uh, wait, uh, so the, the air canal electrode. Uh, so it's sending the, um, I think, AM modulated by FM, or, or is it like just noise modulated, modulated by FM? It's noise modulated by AM at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, is it, I've heard like some people doing like ultrasound brain stimulation. Like, 
is it possible? For, is it like better if it's sitting inside the ultrasound? Maybe like ultrasound could travel a little better as having like um, part of the research, just like maybe passing ultrasound through the ear canal. I think um, I think it could be useful. Um, I see what you're saying. Like inside the ear canal or on the roof roof of the mouth, right back of the throat, back of the neck. Like basically imaging parts of the stimulating parts of the brain that aren't really accessible, right? Like that, that's your that's what you're asking, right? If yeah. It's not necessarily for ISSR, right? But for brain stimulation. But yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's possible. Um, I, I think there's just kind of limited researchers in, in our lab, so we don't always have a bandwidth for this. But we are working with uh, Sheng, Sheng Shu in the um, nanoengineering department, and he's made small flexible ultrasound patches. Right now, we're putting them on the, I don't think I can say actually, but we're putting them on the body somewhere, and we're able to detect things. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, I, you can reach out to like Gert, and he would tell you. Um, I think something that, ha that has uh, crossed my mind is like, you know, the eardrum in the ear is like a very sensitive thing, and you're not really supposed to touch it. Um, you can't really see behind it unless you, the doctors like drill a hole in your skull here. Um, uh, so it'd be cool to like, I think it's dangerous to use ultrasound maybe with the ear canal, with the eardrum, but let's say it wasn't. You could image the cochlea and, and the cochlear nerves and the vestibular membrane and the uh, semicircular tubes um, and like be able to find tumors and, and detect like hearing loss, all those things. So, um, or use laser light, I don't know. Something yeah, like that. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, uh, my question is really amazing, um, being able to image like the cochlea. Uh, so that wasn't what I was thinking first, but that's definitely an uh, interesting application. Thank, thank you so much. All right. Uh, kind of uh, I have one question that I would like to ask <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so this is generally towards the direction of the technology that you're looking at here. And I, want to, I was wondering, like, for the dry EEG ear canal device, have you considered using it for detecting nervous signals in the brainstem or cerebellum, such as for treatment of, like, vertigo and tremors, other motor disabilities? Uh, for the dry electrodes in general or for the ones in the ear? Uh, for the ear canal, yeah. Because you mentioned it was a lot closer to the, to the brain itself, the cerebrum. But I was wondering, is it good for detecting signals in the lower part of the brain? Yeah, so it should be theoretically. Um, and that's a very good question. Unfortunately, like, the cerebellum, cerebellum is what we're talking about, right, um, yeah. is, is often ignored. Um, like the, the exciting stuff people in neuroscience happens in the cortex, right? Motor control, emotion, like higher thinking um, between like primates and, and, and apes and, and humans, right? It's the cortex that really changes, but this, the cerebellum doesn't change all that much, right? Um, so that's one reason why, unfortunately, we haven't looked at it because the, the funding isn't necessarily there, but we could steer our antennas towards it and have a look. The second reason is um, I think it's less defined. The signal coming from the cerebellum is it's weaker and I think it's less synchronous. Um, for example, like I could close my eyes and really think about something scary and I could overwhelm the entire EG signal with one part of my cortex, right? Um, so uh, I think. I'll be open to it. I, what I can tell you is that we haven't haven't really looked at. It. I think signals coming from the cerebellum are weak and not synchronous enough. But because okay. we're in a different because we're in a different location, you might be right. We might have a better shot at it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're really interested in it, you could um, you could like d you could design a simple experiment you know, that that we could do where maybe there's a walking task or a balance task that really lights up the cerebellum, and we, we would see how it compares from the scalp to the ear. Right, and that would be an easy thing to to talk about. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering because like it's it's in the ear canal, and I was thinking, oh, if it's closer to that part of the brain, then that seems to be one direction that the technology could go. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Another thing that maybe you can think about food for thought is inter-ear measurements. So if we tie if we tie one cable between them, which we don't right now, it's all wireless, right? But if we were to connect the both ear devices behind the head with a cable, you can actually do across the brain measurements in a way that people don't do, right? Like across the brain stem, for example, or like the midbrain. Um, you could get some cool information there. Uh, but again, like just the bandwidth really is there. That's why I think that's why we do this, right? If people are interested, they can join us and work on things. Yeah, I'll definitely keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you guys have any more questions, because we're running uh, short on time, is you can always email Ashley and Alice. Uh, Alice, uh, we have their emails uh, in the slides. Um, so, yeah. Um, so to conclude this event, we're hoping that you know. First, thank you for uh, thank you to all our presenters. You know, we really appreciate you having uh, you present about the forefront of uh, neurotechnology. Uh, but to conclude things off, I want to invite all our attendees and participants to share their videos so we could you know uh, take a screenshot uh, just to you know commemorate our time together here. So yeah. Okay, so a little bit about Neurotech at UCSD. Uh, we are a community of neuroscience, data science, and engineering enthusiasts, and we hope to learn from each other, meet prominent players in the field, and build cool projects together. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, this is the place for you. We started in January 2020, and our faculty advisor is Rakash Gilja from the TNL Research Group in the EC department, and we compete in the annual student Neurotech X competition. Some things that we're up to this quarter are we have events every week or two, and so in week three, we have um, a Securing the Brain Designing a Neurosecurity Framework event with Dr. Kan Kanam. Oh no, I messed up. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, so um, a little bit about what we're up to this quarter. Uh, we have events every week or two, and uh, next week we have an event with um, Dr. Kano from uh, University of Central Florida about securing the brain and designing a neurosecurity framework. And it's going to be Tuesday of week three, so be sure to mark calendars and check out the event on Facebook. Um, additionally, we have some recurring events that um, could be helpful for you. Um, if you're, say, an underclassman or an upperclassman interested in just chatting with um, one of our officers that are more experienced in this area, um, we have spotlights every couple weeks or so. So look out on Discord for these casual chats and just join on the voice channels for that. And then additionally, we also are trying to launch a journal club. So um, this is really trying to help us all learn about neurotech together from the most uh, fundamental sources, such as reading articles and learning how to understand the math and everything together. Um, so look out for this event, this recurring event in our newsletter and Discord for more information. And finally, we have two ongoing project teams right now. Um, Michael and Eugene are both working on the EEG Speller as well as Simon. Um, and so we have a good handful of uh, members for each one of these projects. Um, so if you're interested in um, participating in any of these, uh, you can try to reach out. Um, and also we'll be also having some applications uh, later this quarter for future projects. So be on the lookout for that as well.
And so how do you join? Um, yeah, just come out to our events and um, chat with us on Discord. Hopefully it's a welcoming place for you and uh, everyone's welcome. So if you have any feedback about today's event or suggestions for future events, um, go to tinyurl.com slash ftx feedback and we'll be happy to hear. Thank you.